You guys are hungry, aren't you? You should be protecting those mama, those babies better. You better get them babies out of here. Get them out of here. I'm in the pot that this video started out with. And that morning last year, I had hunted in the other pot that I call T-cell and I didn't see anything. I hunted until nine or 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning. And then I drove over to this pot. And while I was in the pot filling this feeder right here, I had those four deer come into the pot. There were four does. And these are wild animals. They're not around people. They're used to like loggers and people doing that type of work. They might go by in their logging trucks or their bulldozers or heavy equipment, but they're not used to seeing people. Uh, they're very wary. So that was odd. That doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it, that's probably the only time that it happens. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm out here on my hunting lease in Gulf County. And, uh, Got a couple deer in the freezer already, so I'm just out here kind of assessing the situation, checking my cameras, seeing if any new bucks have shown up. Check out my plots. I was going to fertilize. It's been about four weeks since we planted, and I was thinking about fertilizing, but uh, we haven't had a lot of rain, and I kind of want the rain to wash in the plots. I'm coming up here on the plot now. That's what it looks like. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? This is the pot that uh, I closed out the video of food pot planning day one. And I was in here with my four wheeler, rolling it out with the cold packer. But uh, you can see it's nice and green. There's no fertilizer on this pot. That's just the way um, the leftover residual fertilizer or whatever kind of nitrogen that the clover had left in the soil. But uh, it's looking pretty good. I will hit it with some triple 13 here just before Christmas. So in the next week or two, I'll come out here and I'll spread. Um, I got two acres, I'll probably do about 10 bags total. That's what I do each year. So this pot will probably get one bag of triple 13. But anyway, I'm gonna check that camera behind me, see if any new bucks have shown up. Uh, this particular camera actually picked up a nice buck last week. Uh, it's nocturnal still, and it will be until probably January or so. But um, always exciting to check the cameras after they've been soaking for a week or two. So let's check them out. Okay, if we come down here close, we can see the little clovers coming up. We can see the chicory, which is the wider leaf. And then the long narrow leaf is either oats, wheat, or rye. And if you look closely, you can see pretty much every, every one is nipped off. Let's take a look at... Uh, this one right here, that looks like oats and it's nipped off right to the ground. And this is sandy up here. The soil actually gets better as you go out into the pot more. But uh, they're definitely keeping it mowed down. Some turkey scratchings there. And probably a raccoon digging up some corn. A good amount of pictures would be 300 or so. And you'll see that I've got 438 pictures in a week on this camera. That's a good amount. That tells me we're getting some good deer activity out here. It's not near the rut yet. It's beginning of December. And we'll look at maybe our, our first pre-rut in the January time frame, And then our true rut is February 7th through 14th. But it's good to see 400 pictures on a camera, especially uh, one that's just over a plot. So I'm pretty excited to see what's on here. None of us really hunt turkeys. Turkeys love corn. So they'll be out here eating up all that corn. You know, you, you put it out there and you, you want it to benefit the wildlife. And I guess you really don't care if the turkeys get some of it. But it is can be a little bit aggravating with the price of corn put out corn for the deer and uh, keep your herd healthy. I mean, obviously you're looking for a harvest opportunity, but also to keep your herd healthy, have nice strong fawns going into the next year too, so they can evade predators. And then you sit in your stand and watch the turkeys eat all your corn, but they gotta eat too, I guess. Okay, we're in my second major pot that's in the same location. And the deer traffic in this pot is just, it's off the charts. I mean, I there is not a square inch on this, uh, 
probably close to one acre in this particular pot, maybe three quarters of an acre, but there is not one square inch of this plot that doesn't have deer tracks. I'm gonna just spin around just so you can get a lay of the land. This was planted on November 1st. It's December 6th or 7th right now. And uh, after, after a month, we really haven't had any rain. It's just the moisture that was already in the soil. But uh, everything's coming up good, but the grains are just getting hammered in this plot. I mean, every single grain is nipped down. You plant the pot to transfer the nutrition from the ground into the deer. So that's exactly what we want, right? We want lots of usage. What, what good is a pretty pot that deer don't use? But this ground is just riddled with deer tracks. And there's a buck track right there. It's sandy, so it's hard to tell. But there is not a square inch of this plot that does not have a track in it. And again, we haven't had rain, so this is compounded, right? Rain would wash away or um, make it look less traveled because uh, only fresh tracks would show up after the rain. But still, you can tell a lot of these tracks in this sandy soil are fresh. And that's after taking a deer off of, right? I took two deer off of this area, these, this plot system. I have three pots in front of this condo. And I've taken two deer already. On Thanksgiving morning, I had six come out and I took a big doe. And then that Saturday after Thanksgiving, I took another doe in the pot that I'm standing in now. Just all, you know, it's herd management. You got to count your does. And if uh, you see that you got too many does, then you got to ask the, the landowner for more tags so you can keep those doe numbers down. You're ultimately looking for a one-to-one -one buck to doe ratio. So you have a real active rut. It keeps the keeps the bucks on the move and uh, allows more harvest opportunities for those same bucks. You know, if you have a buck that's trying to serve a six or seven does, he doesn't have to travel very far, right? Before he can bed up with one and, and uh, service her and then move on to the next one. So uh, our ratio has always been skewed and we did that on purpose because we got tired of not seeing deer. So we let our doe herd grow and uh, we've been actively managing that and taking does here and there but uh, every year you just got to recalculate, you know, check the amount of fawns that you had for that year and see if you have too many does. Um, you know, there can be a case where you don't have enough does like we did, but we might be entering that phase where we have too many does. So we'll take our six off this year, off this land, and then we'll uh, reassess and see if we need to take some more next year. And we could possibly reassess later in the season. And if we're sitting out seeing, if everyone's seeing, you know, 10 or 12 does in their plots and there's three hunters out here, that's 30 some does. And if that's still happening after we filled our tag, then we might look into getting some more tags. It's just a constant management thing. It's a constant monitoring thing. The chances that a new fawn is gonna be a doe is 50%, right? So if you, if you recruit six to eight new fawns on your property, then you probably recruited four does and four bucks, let's say if you had eight new fawns. Um, so that means you gotta take four does off the property just to keep the numbers consistent. If you have a good food source, you also bring more deer onto your property. Mm -hmm. One acre per deer is what they need to sustain, you know, all the food that they need. Now, obviously our pots aren't giving all the food that they need. They have acorns, they have natural browse. They love to browse on, um, on briars, which you wouldn't think so, but gosh, if you got a nice set of briars, you know, in your property, a briar patch, throw some fertilizer on it because uh, they love briars. You know, the ideal is to have 10% of your hunting lease or your, your big property in, uh, in food. And we got 1,200 acres. So that means we would need 120 acres in agriculture, some sort of thing to feed the deer, but we don't have that. We're, we're pushing 10 or 12 acres. Can't have the herd too big. Don't want it too small because you want to watch deer. You don't, you don't want to sit in your stand all day and not see anything, but you also can't have the herd too big because they'll deplete the plots that you have and make them useless. So it's a balancing act. I'm at my plot now we call T-cell or I call T-cell. And that name comes because this plot is in kind of a wet area of the lease. And if you don't know what a thermocell is, you probably haven't hunted in Florida because a thermocell is this little device you carry with you, basically burns an incense type of thing on a hot plate and you keep it in your pocket or close by you in a stand. Supposedly the deer can't smell it, but I don't believe that. Deer can smell a lot of things. 
deer have one of the most developed noses or most complex noses of any animal out there. To put it in perspective, when I first started deer hunting, I used to think, ah, oh, I got some oak spray, right? Deer love acorns. I'll just spray this oak spray all over me and they'll think I'm an oak tree. What I didn't realize, and, and I wouldn't worry about other scents, you know, like detergent, your washing detergent or your deodorant or um, your earwax or whatever other scents that you're emitting. And I would think, man, I'll just douse myself with this oak spray. They'll think I'm an oak tree and I'm good to go, right? I can walk right up to a deer. A deer's nose is so complex that they'll smell that oak spray and it could be the strongest scent that's on you. And they'll go, all right, oak spray, check. Um, you smell like an oak tree. Uh, I smell some pepperoni. You had pizza last night. I smell a little bit of Diet Coke. Um, yep, your clothes were washed in Tide. Uh, your boots, you use this type of oil they can break out the smell, the spectrum, and distinguish between the different smells. So you don't want to smell like anything when you're deer hunting. Those of us that deer hunt a lot, especially those of us that chase bucks, um, you want to be as scent free as possible. I mean, there's people that go to the extremes, like they won't eat anything with garlic like after June uh, so they can hunt in November. They don't want that, that smell in their breath. They change their diet for deer. The deer's nose is that complex, and, and I've seen it in action many, many times. If you're trying to, you know, uh, looking at the lines of a compass and going, I'm 10 degrees off from the wind, this is a good stand to hunt, the wind is going to fool you every time. Right. My takeaway from this whole conversation is a deer has an incredible nose. You fool a deer's nose only one way, and that's by keeping the deer upwind of you. If he's downwind of you and he smells you, especially an older buck, he's gone, um, and or he's going to be nervous and you're going to rush your shot. Uh, you want whatever uh, deer that you're shooting at to be relaxed, not know you're there, and not you not to rush your shot. You're looking for that perfect broadside shot. Um, you know, you can shoot them quartering away, quartering two, but if you're looking for that perfect shot, you want that deer not to know you're there, so you can wait. A deer is always moving. They're just always moving, so you want as much time as possible. You want them not to know that you're there, and uh, the best way to do that is to hunt uh, downwind of the deer. So this is the T-cell plot. We'll do a panoramic here. And this plot has various soil types. It's really dry where I just showed. It's kind of sandy there in the center around that oak tree. And as you get over here to the left, it gets wetter. It's just a whole bunch of different soil types in there, or at least moisture areas. But you can see it's fairly green, uh, pretty consistent with the way that we planted it as far as there's a consistency in the way that we put the seed out. But uh, we could use some rain and also we could use some fertilizer. This, uh, these grains, you can see a little bit of yellowing to them. They're not as green as the last pot we were in and uh, they're getting hammered. I mean, there's just deer tracks all over this pot. This but we've taken four deer so far off of this lease and they've all been taken on the front 600 acres. This is on the back 600 acres. And deer have a, you know, deer do range and they move, but a, a doe pretty much lives within 300 acres. A deer, a buck has more of a, a wider range, more like 600 acres. And then it gets really big during the rut. You know, they could, they could move five miles in one day. But in general, the deer that are around your stand are the deer that are around your stand. Whether you see them or not is a total different story. And that'll depend on food sources and the way you hunt the wind. But the deer that are coming into this plot are unmolested right now. Um, they feel safe. They feel comfortable. I got bucks and does in the daylight out here, and uh, but but I filled my doe tag, so I won't be taking any does off of this particular part of the property. Uh, usually, this is where I get my buck off of this plot here, and I, and actually, I usually get it in that condo back there that's over my shoulder. Okay, Deb and I always stress we're not a how-to channel, and this certainly is not a how-to deer hunt. I'm just out here enjoying nature and uh, just kind of sharing some thoughts as I'm walking around my deer plot. One thing I noticed as I went across this deer pot, and it is just getting hammered. I mean, even worse than when I started talking a few minutes ago, I walked over walked over to this end of the pot, and deer tracks everywhere. They've just really got it eaten down. But uh, for those people out there that don't know, you can look at the feces, the droppings, the the poop of, uh, of deer, and tell, usually tell a buck from a doe. And let me show you the difference. When you see the pellets that are a lot like rabbit pellets like that, that's most likely gonna be a doe. The bigger the pellets, the bigger the deer. So that's a big doe right there. There's some big pellets. This is probably its fawn. And there is a doe 
with a fawn that hangs out in this plot. But when you got the more clumpy formed turds like that, feces, droppings, the more uh, formed ones like that, that's most likely a buck. Anyway, I, I don't know that I've ever read or seen that anywhere that you can look at a, a deer's poop and tell the sex of it, but uh, it, it's definitely true. The droppings are your does and the clumpier ones are your bucks. So maybe you knew that already, but uh, that's, a, that's a fun fact for you. But we wanted to get an update on the hunting season out there and an update on the pot, so there it is. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Please click like if you did. That really helps our channel. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Otherwise, I'll catch you on the next one. Take care, y'all.